Giotto is one of the most important artists in the development of Western art. Preempting by a century many of the preoccupations and concerns of the Italian High Renaissance, his paintings ushered in a new era in painting that brought together religious antiquity and the developing idea of Renaissance humanism. Indeed, his influence on European art was such that many historians believe it was not matched until Michelangelo took over his mantle some two centuries on. Giotto is best known for the way he explored the possibilities of perspective and pictorial space. And in so doing, he brought a new sense of realism to his religious parables. His interest in humanism saw him explore the tension between biblical iconography and the everyday existence of lay worshippers, bringing them closer to God by making art more relevant to their lived experience. His figures were thus infused with an emotional quality not seen before in high art, while his architectural settings were rendered according to the optical laws of proportion and perspective. Very little is known about the biographical details of Giotto di Bondone's life. He is thought to have been the son of a peasant, born in the Mugello, a mountainous area to the north of Florence, which was also the home country of the Medici family, who would later rise to power in the city. Giotto's birthplace has been attributed to a house in the small village of Vicchio, and the date of his birth given as 1277, by the writer and artist Giorgio Vasari in his influential 1550 text, The Lives of the Most Excellent Painters, Sculptors and Architects. However, other sources suggest he was born in 1267, which seems more likely judging by the maturity of some of his early works. The accomplished sculptor Lorenzo Ghiberti, whose achievements in early Renaissance sculpture were indebted to Giotto, recounts a legendary story in his 1452 written work, Commentaries on the Tuscan Artists of the Trecento. He tells how the young Giotto was tending sheep as a child and drew one of them from life on a stone slab. The foremost painter of the day, Cimabue, came across the boy's sketch and was so impressed that he immediately took the young Giotto on as an apprentice. Tradition holds that Giotto was born in a farmhouse near Romignano, a hamlet north of Florence, though recent research has suggested that he was actually born in Florence, the son of a blacksmith. The year of his birth, 1266, is calculated from the fact that Antonio Pucci, the town crier of Florence, wrote a poem in Giotto's honour in which it is stated that he was 70 at the time of his death. However, the word 70 fits into the rhyme scheme of the poem better than a longer and more complex age, so it is possible that Pucci used artistic license. In his Lives of the Artists, Giorgio Vasari relates that Giotto was a shepherd boy, a merry and intelligent child that was loved by all who knew him. According to tradition, Cimabue, the most gifted Florentine painter of his time along with Duccio, discovered Giotto drawing pictures of his sheep on a rock. They were so lifelike that Cimabu approached Bondone and asked if he could take the boy as an apprentice. Vasari also recounts an example of Giotto's skill, writing that when Cimabue was absent from the workshop, his apprentice painted such a lifelike fly on the face of the painting that Cimabue was currently working on, that he later tried to brush it off. The most famous tale to survive is also narrated by Vasari, who tells of when the Pope sent a messenger to Giotto, asking him to send a drawing to demonstrate his skill. Giotto drew in red paint a circle so perfect that it seemed as though it was drawn using a compass, and instructed the messenger to give that to the Pope. 
sending the other drawings to the Pope with the names of those that had made them, the messenger also sent Giotto's, relating how he had made the circle without moving his arm and without compasses, which when the Pope and many of his courtiers understood, they saw that Giotto must surpass greatly all the other painters of his time. This legend led to a proverb, You are rounder than the O of Giotto, that was apparently still used in Vasari's time to describe a dim or slow-witted person. Round, meaning both a perfect circle, as well as slowness and heaviness of mind. Whatever the true beginnings of their professional relationship, it seems likely that Giotto was apprenticed to Cimabue, probably from the age of around ten, where he learned the art of painting. It is thought that Giotto travelled to Rome with the older artist before accompanying him to Assisi, where Cimabue had been commissioned to decorate the lower of the two churches recently built on top of each other to commemorate St. Francis. Life of St. Francis, Assisi, Upper Church. On one occasion, Cimabue went to Assisi to paint several large frescoes at the newly built Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi, and it is possible, though by no means certain, that Giotto went with him. The attribution of the fresco cycle of the life of St. Francis in the Upper Church has been one of the most fiercely disputed acknowledgments in art history, the documents of the Franciscan friars that relate to artistic commissions during this period were destroyed by Napoleon's troops, who stabled horses in the upper church of the Basilica, and scholars have been divided over whether or not Giotto was responsible for the St. Francis cycle. Due to the absence of documentary evidence, it has been convenient to ascribe every fresco in the upper church that was not clearly by Cimabue to Giotto, whose prestige has since greatly overshadowed any of his contemporaries. An early biographical source, Ricobaldo Ferrarese, mentions that Giotto painted at Assisi without specifying the St. Francis cycle. What kind of art Giotto made is testified to by works done by him in the Franciscan churches at Assisi, Rimini, Padua. Since the idea was put forward by the German art historian Friedrich Rintelen in 1912, many scholars have expressed doubt that Giotto was in fact the author of the Upper Church frescoes. Following technical examinations and comparisons of the workshop painting processes at Assisi and Padua in 2002, strong evidence suggests that Giotto did not paint the St. Francis cycle. There are many differences between the Francis cycle and the arena chapel frescoes that are difficult to account for by the stylistic development of an individual artist. Nevertheless, the high artistic achievements of the fresco cycle clearly illustrate the influences that the young Giotto was affected by while working in Cimabue's prestigious studio. St. Francis of Assisi, San Francesco d'Assisi, was an Italian Roman Catholic friar and preacher who went on to found the Men's Order of Friars Minor, the Women's Order of St. Clair, the Third Order of St. Francis, and the Custody of the Holy Land. Pope Gregory Nunn canonized Francis on 16th of July 1228. Along with St. Catherine of Siena, he was designated Patron Saint of Italy. He later became associated with patronage of animals and the natural environment, and it became customary for Catholic and Anglican churches to hold ceremonies blessing animals on his feast day of 4th of October. In 1219, Francis went to Egypt in an attempt to convert the Sultan to put an end to the conflict of the Crusades. At this time, the Franciscan order had grown to such an extent that its primitive organizational structure was no longer sufficient. He returned to Italy to organize the order. Once his community was authorized by the Pope, he withdrew increasingly from external affairs. 
Francis is also known for his love of the Eucharist, and in 1223 he arranged for the first Christmas live nativity scene. In 1224 he received the stigmata during the apparition of seraphic angels in a religious ecstasy, making him the first recorded person to bear the wounds of Christ's passion. He died during the evening hours of October 3, 1226, while listening to a reading he had requested of Psalm 142. At the request of the Franciscan order, it is believed that Sima Bue was commissioned to create a series that had never been attempted before in such a fashion, detailing the history and progress of the great saint and founder of the order, whom the old people of the area might still be able to remember as a living person. The intention was to develop a pictorial version of the life story of the saint, which would then act as the model for all further representations. The cycle of images concerns 25 separate scenes of St. Francis's life, starting with homage of a simple man and culminating with the dream of St. Gregory. This cycle of pictures has since occupied generations of art historians, with attributions of the lead artist veering between an unknown Roman artist, Cavallini and Giotto.
Sometime around 1290, Giotto married a Florentine woman called Ricevuta di Lapo del Pella, better known as Ciuta, with whom he had a number of children. There is a quite probably baseless story that someone once asked Giotto how he could create such beautiful paintings but produce such ugly children, to which he replied that he made his children in the dark. Around the same time as his marriage to Ciuta, Cimabue left Assisi for another commission, and Giotto took over his work and was approached to create a fresco cycle for the top half of the walls in the upper church. Although Cimabue was Giotto's teacher, the pupil soon usurped his master, and his skill was recognized in his lifetime by contemporaries such as the poet Dante Alighieri, who wrote in his Divine Comedy, O empty glory of human powers. In painting, Cimabue thought to hold the field, and now Giotto has the cry, so that the other's fame is diminished. Between around 1290 and 1295, Giotto undertook his first major work in Assisi, in which he made a number of significant pictorial advances. His work was a success, and he was commissioned to create a further cycle of frescoes for the church. After a relatively prolonged stay in Assisi, Giotto began a period of frequent travel among the city-states of Italy, a pattern that would characterize his whole career. Giotto set up workshops in a number of different locations where his style was emulated and where many of his assistants went on to strike out with their own careers. Isaac Blessing Jacob, circa 1290-1295, historians have grappled with the problem of exactly what Giotto painted while at Assisi, though there is general consensus that he was responsible for this and other important frescoes. Isaac Blessing Jacob, one of Giotto's earliest extant works, forms part of a fresco cycle in the upper church of the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi. Sitting along the top half of the church's walls, the frescoes portray narratives from the Old Testament that were key bases for beliefs of the Franciscan monastic order. Here, the elderly Isaac is shown blessing his younger son Jacob as Jacob offers him food while Isaac's wife Rebecca watches. This fresco reveals early versions of Giotto's technical innovations in painting, that of rendering believable space between human figures. Although Giotto creates an artificial scene by cutting away two of the walls, he also transforms the moment of Isaac blessing Jacob into an everyday event. Using axial perspective, a technique in which lines recede parallel to each other and into the distance, Giotto places the three figures here in an interior that has spatial depth. We can see, for instance, how the foot of the bed recedes. While artists had employed the technique of axial perspective since antiquity, Giotto combines it with numerous details of casual daily life to make the interior more approachable. A curtain hangs across the back of the room to evoke a private space, and the sheets over Isaac's feet are rumpled as if he has just sat up. Isaac, Jacob and Rebecca too seem more like actual human bodies. Not only do sheets and clothes drape over their forms to suggest human anatomy from shoulders to feet, but their faces have distinct contours. Isaac's face is angular and lined around his nose like the face of an older man, and Jacob's face has fuller cheeks with little suggestion of bone structure like that of a youth. In addition, Jacob's steady, concentrated gaze at Isaac complements Isaac's pensive sideways gaze. Such humanist innovations brought a new psychological dimension to proceedings. 
Giotto's more realistic depiction of human figures and their spatial relations had a marked influence on later artists, including the early 15th century Fra Angelico and Masaccio. When painting the expulsion of Adam and Eve in his fresco cycle for the Brancacci Chapel, C. Shul 1425, S. Maria del Carmine, Florence, Masaccio echoed Giotto's perspectival rendering of architectural elements and evocation of emotional response. Adam and Eve bend over awkwardly with shame and grief as they walk past an arch receding into the distance. Giotto's fresco thus highlights shifts in European painting techniques that would become key for Renaissance artists and subsequent generations. celebration of Christmas at Greccio, circa 1300. This work, also located in the upper church at Assisi, uses perspective to depict a religious space normally inaccessible to lay worshippers. A scene from Giotto's fresco cycle narrating the life of St. Francis, this painting displays the saint creating the first nativity scene, now familiar in the celebration of Christmas across the Christian world we see St. Francis laying Christ in a manger. Giotto shows St. Francis clearly behind the choir screen that usually divided the church into space for lay worshippers and space for religious figures such as the Franciscan monks. Not only are the white panels of the choir screen visible, but Giotto further emphasizes the unusual setting through his use of perspective to create a definable space in front of the viewer. We can see how the floor is tipped upward, the pulpit recedes away from us, and the structure at the left is shown at a raking diagonal. In addition, there is space behind the choir screen since women step across its threshold, and the crucifix leans backwards at a reclining angle. Beyond its artistic innovations, as the art historian Jacqueline E. Young has observed, Giotto's fresco offers unusual insight into the complexity of social interactions within a medieval church. To the right and left of St. Francis, well-dressed and so wealthy, individuals in flowing and colourful robes surround four Franciscan monks in brown robes. Since the monks stand behind the well-dressed individuals with their mouths open, the scene appears to offer lay worshippers instruction in the religious event before them. They are not only allowed behind the choir screen, but they can learn by looking at St. Francis and listening to the monks. Women too are permitted to enter this area as they stand at the threshold of the choir screen. However, they occupy a more ambiguous position, at once marginally placed on the threshold and centrally placed laterally in the choir screen. This fresco thus offers evidence of artistic innovation to art historians and also to social historians pointing to distinctions in gendered interactions along with the approaches to the secular and divine at the time. At the turn of the century, Giotto travelled to Florence, Rimini and possibly Rome. He then spent around three years in Padua, working on one of his most complete and best-known works in the Arena Chapel. During his stay in Padua, Giotto may have met the poet Dante, who had been exiled there from Florence. In the decade between 1305 and 1315, Giotto seems to have travelled a number of times between Florence and Rome. He worked on commissions for some of the most important churches, including St. Peter's in Rome, the church that preceded the current basilica, where he was commissioned by the Roman Cardinal Jacopo Stefaneschi to create two works, Giotto's only known mosaic work, C310, 
and a large polyptic altarpiece, see 13 to 13. Badia Polyptic, completed circa 1300. The Badia Polyptic is now housed in the Uffizi Gallery of Florence. The sources of Lorenzo Ghiberti's Commentari and Giorgio Vasari's Lives agree in mentioning the presence of a polyptic by Giotto at the high altar in the Badia Fiorentina, though it remained lost for century. In the 19th century, the polyptic was found in the archives of the Museum of Santa Croce of Florence, and identified thanks to a cartouche attached to it with the label Badia di Firenze. The dating of the work is disputed, ranging from the early 14th century to a period following Giotto's work in the Cappella degli Scrovegni. A polyptic is a panel painting divided into several sections. The Badia polyptic is composed of five framed paintings with a triangular cusp portraying the busts of the Virgin, center, and, from the left, St. Nicholas of Bari, John the Evangelist, St. Peter and St. Benedict, identified by their names below and their traditional attributes. This polyptic is noted for Giotto's extensive use of chiaroscuro, contrasting of light and shadow, a pioneer technique at that time. Notable details include the rich garments and the crozier of St. Nicholas, the gesture of the child grasping at his mother's neckline and St. Peter's stole. Similar details were used by Giotto also in Rimini Crucifix and the Stigmata of St. Francis, confirming the 14th century dating. Crucifix of Rimini, according to documents dated to 1301 and 1304, Giotto possessed large estates in Florence, and it is probable that he was already leading a large workshop and receiving commissions from patrons scattered across Italy. As Giotto's fame spread, he was called to work in Rimini, in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy where today there remains only a crucifix painted before 1309 and conserved in the Church of St. Francis. This artwork is believed to have influenced the rise of the Rimini school of Giovanni and Pietro da Rimini. The crucifix has lost its panels that were once attached to the cross limbs and the apex, though one of them resurfaced many years later in a private collection in England, bearing a depiction of God the Father. The crucifix reveals the artist's treatment of the subject in a more mature approach as seen in the portrayal of Christ's white, semi-translucent garment and the emotional expression on his face. However, the sculptural emphasis still reveals it as a work completed before the wonders of the Arena Chapel paintings in Padua.
Scenes from the life of Joachim, Padua, Arena Chapel. Around 1305, Giotto produced his most influential work, the painted decoration of the interior of the Scrovegni Chapel in Padua. Enrico degli Scrovegni commissioned the chapel to serve as a family worship and burial space, even though his parish church was nearby. Its construction caused some concern among the clerics at the Eremitani church next door. The chapel is externally a very plain building of pink brick, constructed next to an older palace that Scroveni was restoring for himself. The palace, now gone, and the chapel were on the site of a Roman arena, for which reason it is commonly known as the Arena Chapel. It has been suggested that Enrico commissioned the chapel as penitence for his sin of usury, which at the time was considered unjust. Dante himself accused Enrico's father of the occupation and condemned him in his Divine Comedy. The theme of the decoration is salvation, and there is an emphasis on the Virgin Mary, as the chapel is dedicated to the Annunciation and to the Virgin of Charity. As is common in similar projects in medieval Italy, the west wall is dominated by the Last Judgment. The cycle is divided into 37 scenes, arranged around the lateral walls in three tiers, starting in the upper register with the story of Joachim and Anna, the parents of the Virgin, and continuing with the story of Mary. The life of Jesus occupies two registers. The Last Judgment fills the entire pictorial space of the counter façade. Much of the blue in the fresco has been worn away by time, because Scrovegni ordered that the expensive pigment ultramarine blue should be painted on top of the already dry fresco, secco fresco, to preserve its brilliance. For this reason, it has disintegrated faster than the other colors that have been fastened within the plaster of the fresco. An example of this decay can clearly be seen on the robe of Christ as he sits on the donkey. The six scenes concerning the story of Joachim and Anne, located in the top tier on the right wall, narrate how Joachim was expelled from the temple due to his childlessness, explaining how the angel appeared to Anne with news she would bear a child. The third image tells how Joachim made a sacrificial offering that was pleasing to God. Next, an angel appears to him in a dream, announcing the arrival of a daughter named Mary. The series concludes with an illustration of how Joachim returns to Jerusalem, meeting Anne at the Golden Gate, where Mary is conceived by the embrace of Anne and her aging husband. Of particular note in the cycle, the Annunciation to St. Anne reveals Giotto's blossoming development in the depiction of space. The three-dimensional rendering of the room provides depth for the image, achieving a sense of reality in the depiction of the scene. The interior and furnishings of the room are delicately portrayed, while the folds in the maid's dress also evince a realistic style of representation.
Scenes from the Life of the Virgin, Padua, Arena Chapel. Occupying the upper left wall, opposite the Joachim sequence, are six paintings narrating events from the life of the Virgin. They relate the birth of the Virgin, the presentation of the Virgin in the temple, the rods brought before the temple, the prayer of the suitors, the marriage of the Virgin, and the wedding procession. Giotto has adopted the principle of a single architectural structure during the sequence of Joachim and the Virgin. The same box-like house is depicted in the birth of the Virgin as previously seen in the Joachim cycle image, the Annunciation of St. Anne. Meanwhile, the same temple is repeated in the presentation of the Virgin as previously seen in the expulsion of Joachim, though this time portrayed from the opposite side. This repetition of the same structures ensures consistency in the series and allows the artist to experiment in depicting space with the same objects from various angles. Up until Giotto's time, the contemporary art was restricted to the flat-plane two-dimensional works that epitomized Byzantine art. Giotto was the first artist to inspire his contemporaries with a desire to produce a sense of space in their depictions, heralding a new form of art that would eventually lead to the wonders of the High Renaissance. The sequence of the life of the Virgin continues on the lunette above the chancel arch and in the sections immediately below and to the sides of the arch. The chapel was officially dedicated to the event of the Annunciation, and this key scene occurs in the most conspicuous section of wall. In the lunette, God the Father is enthroned, though this section has not survived well, being badly preserved where part of the painting also functioned as a door. The angels are carefully positioned to convey a sense of space, accentuated by the elaborate section of three-dimensional steps supporting the throne. A striking mosaic pattern produced in fresco adorns these steps, adding to the sense of austere majesty. The lower section of the fresco concerns the Annunciation itself, related in the two spandrels on each side of the arch. On the left is Gabriel signalling across to Mary the news that she will bear the Son of God. Both figures are presented as assured and solid forms. Mary's arms are portrayed with masterful foreshortening, a technique rare at that time in art. Another innovation of the artist can be seen in his representation of the halos. When halos were presented as round discs, they often presented a challenge to artists in how to represent them on figures in profile. Giotto's solution is to delineate the halo as an oval shape, once again heightening an illusion of depth.
Scenes from the Life of Christ, Padua, Arena Chapel. The final series of scenes in the Arena Chapel narrate the life of Christ, starting on the middle right with five images, before running on to the middle left for another five scenes. The sequence then returns to the right wall for five images below the previous five, and finishes on the lower right wall in five more scenes. Of particular note in the series are the Nativity and the Flight into Egypt. In the former, a well-constructed shed is depicted, which reappears in the following image, the Adoration of the Magi, but from an alternative angle. The structure provides a sense of depth to the image, conveying the illusion that Mary and her newborn child project out of the painting, ensuring that it is no simple flat representation. The flight into Egypt, one of Giotto's most famous images, presents the view of a rocky landscape, with the Virgin and Infant Christ filling the very centre of the composition. The emotive element of the scene is the nurturing presentation of Mary, as she holds Christ closely to her at this time of difficulty. The baby appears to lean into his mother, his unusually long arm holding dearly on. The intimate impression is heightened by the elaborate folds on Mary's garment and the determined stance of the mother. Going against the usual conventions adopted by artists at that time, Giotto portrays the Virgin starkly in profile, her face convincingly natural, breaking away from the medieval tendency to depict simplistic facial forms. When first unveiled to his contemporaries, this portrayal of the Virgin would have been surprising for artists still restricted to the tradition of Byzantine representation. Another famous image appearing later in the series concerns the kiss of Judas. A dramatic and intense scene, the traitor Judas Iscariot is presented, as in other scenes in the life as Christ, as an ugly man, conforming to the tradition that an evil man most take on an unappealing appearance. The scene is dominated by Judas's imposing figure, his large orange robe, which gains our attention by the portrayal of light and shade given to the rich folds. The angelic face of Christ, juxtaposed to the hideous face of Judas, provides a stark pictorial contrast of the forces of good versus evil.
Lamentation, circa 1305, Giotto's Lamentation of the Death of Christ, a popular narrative for 14th century religious paintings, is the most famous of his frescoes for the Arena Chapel in Padua. Considered a bona fide masterpiece of Proto Renaissance painting, Giotto's frescoes revealed a groundbreaking style of naturalism, overturning the flat, two dimensional conventions of medieval painting. The Arena, or Scrovegni Chapel murals, consist of 39 consecutive scenes depicting events in the life of the Virgin Mary and events in the life of Christ. The overarching theme is one of redemption, and this probably reflected a desire for the Scrovegni family, who grew rich on money lending, to appease their conscience and redress their sins. In Giotto's lamentation, Christ has been lifted down from the cross, and his lifeless body is attended to by haloed relatives and disciples. Mary, the focus of the picture, cradles her son's head while Mary Magdalene mourns at Christ's feet. John the Evangelist, meanwhile, opens his arms wide in a gesture that connotes devastation and sympathy for Christ's suffering. Giotto renders the mourners' emotions through the fine detail in their hands and feet, and in their bowed heads and open mouths that appear to quiver in grief. Not only does Giotto bring his human figures to life, his mise-en-scene lends the image a greater sense of spatial realism too. For instance, the foreshortened figures of the grieving angels and the diagonal lines of the mountain ridge bring a sense of deep space to the composition. The combination of naturalized human figures and three-dimensional depth effectively signaled the demise, amongst progressives at least, of the flat, largely symbolic, Byzantine style in art. Giotto's approach provided inspiration for the Florentine Renaissance and, more widely, Renaissance art throughout Europe. For his part, Giotto's style carried his faith in the message of St. Francis of Assisi, which espoused a new sense of religious freedom whereby the mortal would be transformed into a better, higher being through the touch of the divine. Virtues and Vices, Padua, Arena Chapel. Below the final narrative scenes of the life of Christ, Giotto painted the allegories of the seven virtues on the right wall and their counterpart, seven vices, on the left wall in monochrome grey, contrasting dramatically with the colourful images above. The monochrome frescoes appear as marble statues with carefully depicted recesses from which each figure appears to project. Furthermore, the virtues tend to face their opposite natures, as the allegories of justice and injustice face each other in the middle. Prudence faces foolishness, and charity faces envy. The most striking virtue and vice are justice and injustice, which are larger than the other images. Both allegories are presented as rulers, with small reliefs on their throne denoting their status as figures of good and evil, respectively. Justice is a beautiful female, seated on a majestic throne, her hands balanced with scales connoting fair and equal rule. Alternatively, injustice is a stern and cruel-looking king, who does not look face-on with the viewer, but is instead portrayed in profile, while his hands tightly grip a pike and sword hilt, stressing his preference for violence. Beneath him in the lower section of the fresco, a violent crime is being committed against a sprawled nude female form, 
identifying the evil of that ruler's reign. Due to the bland and dull-hued nature of the virtues and vices, some have questioned Giotto's authorship. Nevertheless, the notable contrast between the monochrome figures and the colorful scenes above, increased by the severe depiction of stone, provides pictorial variety to an otherwise overfilled space of color and drama.
Last Judgment, Padua Arena Chapel. In Christian theology, the Last Judgment is the final and eternal judgment by God of the people in every nation, resulting in the glorification of some and the punishment of others. The concept is found in all the canonical Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Matthew. The subject of the Last Judgment has inspired numerous artistic depictions over the centuries, and Giotto's remains one of the most influential interpretations of the theme. The fresco was completed in the west of the church and is dominated by the large figure of Christ in majesty at the center. The heavenly host appears above, and the twelve apostles sit to the left and to the right of Christ, while beneath them the scene is divided into two sections by the cross. On the right sinners plunge into the moor of hell, while the righteous are led by angels towards heaven in the left section. Though the fresco is divided into traditional registers, Giotto differs from his contemporaries in his fine attention to detail, particularly in the way he innovatively represents abstract beliefs. Christ is enthroned as supreme judge in a rainbow-fused mandola, an almond-shaped aureole of light surrounding the entire figure of a holy person in Christian art. The deep and rich gold background and the delicate way in which it is depicted stress the majestic brilliance of Christ. In the top left and right, two angels appear to peel back the image itself, revealing a glimpse of New Jerusalem. The way in which the very fabric of the fresco itself projects out plays with the notion of representation and reality, as the illusionary nature of painting itself is questioned by the device. The top middle section of the wall is interrupted by a large window, therefore Giotto presents the choirs of angels as disappearing behind it, creating a sense of depth to the image, especially as two angels only have partially visible heads, adding to the illusion. The donor Enrico degli Scrovegni, who commissioned the chapel to serve as a place of family worship and who was still alive at the time of the fresco's completion, is represented kneeling next to the righteous souls being resurrected. Scrivegni offers his chapel to the Virgin Mary, while assisted by a priest whose fine white robes seem to hang over the arch of the portal, once again adding an element of three-dimensionality to the image. Scrovegni came from a family of moneylenders and was mostly a usurer himself. Therefore it is believed the chapel was built as an act of atonement for the sins of the Scrovegni family. Hell, however, is the most arresting aspect of the image. Flames of torment pull suffering figures down into its horrifying depths. Beast-like devils are portrayed torturing, raping and mutilating the naked forms of the sinners. The huge depiction of Satan feeds upon one sinner, the legs protruding from his maw, while he excretes another figure at the same time, suggesting the hideous cycle in store for the sinners of the world. In spite of the deterioration of the fresco over the centuries, Giotto's Last Judgment remains a vibrant and striking image, an early Renaissance spectacle which many visitors from across the world flock to see and marvel at.
Ogni Santi Madonna, now housed in Florence's Uffizi Gallery, the Ogni Santi Madonna portrays the Virgin Mary with the Christ child seated on her lap, surrounded by saints and angels. This form of representation of the Virgin is called a Maestar, a popular choice at the time. The Ogni Santi Madonna is often celebrated as the first painting of the Renaissance due to its use of innovative naturalism and escape from the constraints of Gothic art. Generally dated to C. 1310, it was completed in Florence and is one of the few works by the artist for which there are several extant documents supporting its authenticity as a Giotto piece. There are several sources that show he spent many years living and working in Florence. An early manuscript document of 1418 attributes the painting to Giotto, though it is Ghiberti's autobiography that provides the most solid evidence. Originally painted for the high altar of the Ognissanti Franciscan Church in Florence, which was built for the Humiliati, a small religious order at the time, the Ognissanti Madonna was one of many grand artworks specially commissioned for the building. The altarpiece reveals numerous styles of art that influenced Giotto. The traditional Italo-Byzantine style is demonstrated in both the rich gold colouring employed throughout the painting and the flattened gold background. The formalised representation of an icon retains the stiffness of Byzantine art, as does the hierarchy of scale, rendering the central figure of the Madonna and Christ Child much larger in size than the surrounding saints and religious figures. However, Giotto creates several innovations in the image. The figures eschew the bounds of Byzantine art and appear as weighty three-dimensional forms, similar to sculptures as seen in classical Roman sculpture. The Madonna's intricately decorated throne features a specific use of coloured marble as a surface decoration, redolent of the early Christian era, showing that Giotto knew the art of that period. The influence of several key artists is identifiable in the Ognissanti Madonna, most notably Cimabue, as suggested by Giotto's use of a symmetrical composition. Cimabue portrayed the same subject in 1280 in Virgin and Child Enthroned, also imitating aspects of the Italo-Byzantine style, though Cimabue's features more Byzantine conventions. The depictions of the angel's wings in Giotto and Cimabue's artworks clearly resemble each other and both evoke an initial sense of severity. Giotto seems to have learned from his teacher the importance of volume and forms in space. He was also inspired by many contemporary sculptors, including Nicola and Giovanni Pisano, whose works share influences of northern Gothic art. Giotto appreciated the power of great dramatic compositions, which he imbued in his Ognissanti Madonna. Giotto is now widely recognized as the first artist to depict full three-dimensional figures in Western art. Additionally, he used a much smaller space than other contemporary artists, emphasizing the importance of the bodies in the painting. He cast aside many aspects of Byzantine art that would flatten the painting. Within his Virgin and Child Enthroned, Cimabue uses gold tracing to delineate the folds of the fabric. Conversely, Giotto's fabric folds are more realistic, utilizing light, shadow, and color, while avoiding actual lines to fashion the appearance of fabric. Contours of the body underneath these fabric folds are also visible, specifically in the Virgin's knees and also around her breasts. By adopting a value scale, a distinct range of light and dark is produced, achieving a sense of volume in his figures through the slight haziness, a convention picked up by Leonardo da Vinci and later Renaissance artists. Scenes from the life of Mary Magdalene, Assisi, Lower Church. 
From 1306 to 1311, Giotto was based once more in Assisi, where he painted frescoes in the transept area of the lower church, including the life of Mary Magdalene, the life of Christ, and Franciscan allegories, drawing on stories from the Golden Legend and including the portrait of Bishop Teobaldo Pontano, who commissioned the work. Several assistants are recorded to have worked with Giotto, including one Palerino di Guido. However, the style of the lower church frescoes demonstrates developments from the earlier works at Padua. The Magdalen Chapel of the lower church is a lateral chapel in the corner between the northern transept and the nave. The fresco decoration features different forms, medallions with half-length figures in the compartments of the vault, standing saints in the inside face of the entrance, narrative scenes on the walls and on the lunettes, and two portraits of donors on the end walls. There was more wall space in the Magdalen Chapel, and so Giotto and his assistants were able to portray the subject of the life of Mary Magdalene in greater detail. Two paintings in the cycle appeared previously in the Padua series of The Life of Christ, The Raising of Lazarus and Nolimi Tangere. Though the figures remain mostly the same, the second interpretations of the subjects appear much more imposing, conveying a sense of monumental drama. As the artists were allowed more room to represent these scenes, Christ and the other figures are presented with greater space, and so Christ's gesture is more imposing and the poses of the two Marys more expressive. The paintings exhibit a much gentler handling of landscape in the background, and Giotto's sensitive and soft depiction of Christ's face indicates a more mature approach to his work. The paintings are portrayed in mock architecture embrasures, supported by twisting columns, creating the impression that they project out from the picture plane, promoting a sense of depth. Another scene depicts Mary Magdalene, to whom the chapel is dedicated, standing as she grasps the hands of Cardinal Teobaldo Pontano, the Bishop of Assisi from 1296 to 1329, who commissioned the decoration of the chapel. The scene is enclosed within a painted frame, imitating red marble and mosaic inlays, as a vivid demonstration of the Cardinal's divine gift to the people of Assisi. The human figures of the Assisi Lower Church frescoes use warmer colours than the Paduan frescoes, and the eyes of the characters are often pale, suggesting a more naturalistic approach. The dark-haired figures in the previous cycles are replaced with light blonde or red-coloured alternatives, accentuating a softer depiction. Scenes from the Life of Christ 
Assisi, Lower Church. A new decoration of the Lower Church in Assisi, including the North Transept, was undertaken in keeping with the first centenary of the death of St. Francis. Franciscan authors attribute the fresco cycle on the ceiling to Giotto, though it is now generally agreed to be the work of two of his followers, now designated as Parente di Giotto and the Master of the Vele. The fresco cycle incorporates nine large scenes from the life of Christ. On one side, there are scenes from the life of the Virgin and the childhood of Christ, separated by decorative bands with busts of prophets, while the other side represents scenes from the Passion of Christ. Rich in their chromatic force, the scenes are notable for their stunning blue backgrounds and their debt to Giotto's pioneering techniques. Of particular note is the three-dimensional quality of the structure in the presentation of Christ at the temple. The complex depiction of the architecture is impressive, while Mary and Jesus almost seem to be cast in secondary consideration as the space between them is instead used to stress the importance of the building. Three separate planes are presented, with two figures on the far left standing on a wooden platform in front of the stone structure, creating the first section of the interior. Then the main focus of the painting, the presentation of Christ by the Virgin, occupies the middle space by the altar. The final plane is empty of human interference, instead housing an elaborate vaulted roof and intricate piece of stone carving decoration. Even the angles of the side widows are used to continue the illusion of depth, which, until the time of Giotto, had never been accomplished with such remarkable achievement. The crucifixion in the series is also a notable feature, being declared by some as Giotto's greatest rendering of the demanding subject, celebrated for its refined use of color. Resemblances between the figure of Christ and the frescoes in the Arena Chapel indicate that this was completed later. Some commentators have gone so far as to suggest that the painting is in fact the entire work of Giotto. The delicate delineation of Christ on the cross suggests a high level of naturalism. Christ's ultra-white skin and the bloody marks recently left by the flagellation of the Passion achieve an imposing sense of suffering. In Christ's face we can glimpse the whites of his lifeless and half-closed eyes, and the faces of the three kneeling Franciscans are depicted in realistic detail. The intense emotion experienced by St. John and the two Marys is conveyed through the range of modulated gestures in the figures. St. John weeps quietly, while the beautiful and devout Mary screams in grief, and the Magdalene appears to grimace in pain.
Scenes from the Life of St. Francis, Florence Bardi Chapel. According to Lorenzo Ghiberti, Giotto painted chapels for four different Florentine families in Florence's Santa Croce, although he does not identify which chapels they were. However, Vasari's account of the life of Giotto allows us to identify the chapels. The Peruzzi Chapel, featuring a sequence of paintings on the life of St. John the Baptist and St. John the Evangelist. The Bardi Chapel, detailing the life of St. Francis, the Lost Juni Chapel, Stories of the Apostles, and the Tozingi Spinelli Chapel, Stories of the Holy Virgin. As with almost everything in Giotto's career, the dates of the fresco decorations that survive in Santa Croce are disputed. The Bardi Chapel, immediately to the right of the main chapel of the church, was painted in true fresco, and some scholars believe the simplicity of its settings appear relatively close to the Padua paintings, while the Peruzzi Chapel's more complex settings suggest a later date. The Bardi Chapel's series of scenes concerning the life of St. Francis follows a similar iconography to the frescoes in the upper church at Assisi, dating from approximately 30 years earlier. A comparison of the two series highlights Giotto's increased attention to expression in the human figures and the simpler, better integrated architectural forms. Giotto represents only seven scenes from the saint's life in the later Bardi series, and the narrative is arranged differently from convention. The story starts on the upper left wall with St. Francis renounces his father. The narrative continues across the chapel to the upper right wall with the approval of the Franciscan rule, before moving down the right wall to the trial by fire, across the chapel again to the left wall for the appearance at Arles, down the left wall to the death of St. Francis, and across once more to the posthumous visions of Fra Agostino and the Bishop of Assisi. The stigmatization of St. Francis, which chronologically belongs between the appearance at Arles and the death of St. Francis, is located outside the chapel, above the entrance arch. This arrangement encourages viewers to interact with the artworks, linking the scenes as we pair frescoes across the chapel space or relate triads of frescoes along each wall. These connected scenes suggest meaningful symbolic relationships between different events in the saint's life. It is believed that Giotto was commissioned to paint this series by the banker Ridolfo de Bardi, who had inherited his father's banking house and commercial interests. This involved maintaining a good relationship with the powers that determined the politics of the day, including the Pope, the Neapolitan ruling house of Anjou, and the Guelph party. Ridolfo was able to continue cultivating this highly effective mixture of faith, politics and money for the next three decades until his house went bankrupt in the 1340s. The manifestation of St. Francis, favoured by the order since 1316, must have been particularly appealing to a banker, since it no longer expressed the original significance of personal poverty. Unlike the adjacent Peruzzi Chapel, the construction of the architecture portrayed in the frescoes is here based on a viewpoint within the chapel. The perspective of the architectural structures in the paintings change with logical consistency, as the higher the register, the greater the foreshortening is depicted from below, increasing the impression of fluidity between real and painted space.
In the early 1300s, the seat of the papacy was not in Rome but in Avignon, France. The cardinals of Rome were fighting for the papacy to be returned to their city and duly commissioned Giotto to produce works, including a mosaic for the façade of the old St. Peter's Basilica, of which only fragments remain, Rome's most significant papal church. Cardinal Stefaneschi expressed his confidence that the Pope would eventually return and set about elevating the spiritual importance of his Roman seat. It is thought, therefore, that Stefaneschi commissioned Giotto, who was by now a painter of considerable professional renown, as part of his political strategy. During this period, Giotto also received important commissions for the Church of Santa Croce in Florence. Somewhere around 1313, meanwhile, he worked on a chapel dedicated to the Peruzzi's, a rich and influential family of bankers, in which he created two fresco cycles depicting John the Evangelist and John the Baptist. The member of the Peruzzi family who commissioned the work was named Giovanni, or John, and the frescoes would appear to be intended to forge a link between the family, the city of Florence, and the patron saints that they worshipped. Scenes from the Life of John the Baptist Florence, Peruzzi Chapel The Peruzzi Chapel, which is adjacent to the Bardi Chapel, was largely painted as secco, a wall painting technique where pigments mixed with an organic binder or lime are applied onto a dry plaster. The Asseco technique contrasts with the fresco technique, where the painting is executed on a layer of wet plaster. This technique, quicker but less durable than true fresco, has resulted in a seriously deteriorated condition. Scholars that date this cycle earlier in Giotto's career see the growing interest in architectural expansion it displays as close to the developments of the frescoes in the lower church at Assisi, while the Bardi frescoes have a softness of colour that indicates a new direction for the artist in his work, probably under the influence of Sienese art, suggesting a later date. The Peruzzi Chapel features two lots of three frescoes concerning the life of St. John the Baptist. On the left wall we have the Annunciation of John's birth to his father Zacharias, the birth and naming of John, and the Feast of Herod. On the right wall the three scenes from the life of St. John the Evangelist are the visions of John on Ephesus, the raising of Drusiana, and the ascension of John. The choice of scenes has been related to both the patrons and the Franciscans. Due to the deteriorated condition of the frescoes, it is difficult to assess Giotto's style in the chapel, though the paintings indicate signs of his typical interest in controlled naturalism and psychological penetration. The Peruzzi Chapel was especially renowned during the Renaissance, and it is believed that Giotto's compositions influenced Masaccio's frescoes at the Brancacci Chapel, and Michelangelo is also believed to have studied them. The construction of the Peruzzi Chapel was made possible by the influential banker, Donato di Arnoldo Peruzzi, who left additional money for this memorial chapel in his will in 1299. It was most likely his grandson, Giovanni di Rinieri Peruzzi, that donated the murals honouring John the Evangelist and John the Baptist. The juxtaposition of the two John cycles is unusual, and researchers believe it contains a mixture of religious and secular iconography. John the Evangelist was the donor's namesaint. John the Baptist was patron saint both of the city of Florence and of St. Francis, to whom Santa Croce is dedicated. In his family's memorial chapel, the banker Peruzzi, therefore, has commissioned a sequence that connects his own memory and that of his family with the religious background of the Franciscans and the fate of the city, in which the Peruzzis were one of the most influential families.
The Peruzzi Chapel was much admired by Renaissance painters. It is known too that Giotto's compositions later influenced Masaccio's work on Capella Brancacci. According to surviving financial records, somewhere between 1314 to 27, Giotto also painted the famous altarpiece, the Ognisanti Madonna, now housed in the Uffizi, where it is on display next Cimabue's Santa Trinita Madonna and Duccio's Rucellai Madonna. Returning to Rome in 1320, Giotto completed the Stefaneschi triptych, now housed in the Vatican Museum, for Cardinal Jacopo, who also commissioned him to decorate St. Peter's apse. The frescoes were destroyed during the 16th century renovation. Stefaneschi triptych. In 1320, Giotto painted the Stefaneschi triptych, now housed in the Vatican Museum, for Cardinal Giacomo Gaetano Stefaneschi. The triptych is one of the few works by Giotto for which firm evidence of a commission exists. The Cardinal also commissioned Giotto to decorate the apse of St. Peter's Basilica with a cycle of frescoes that were destroyed during the 16th century renovation. According to Vasari, Giotto remained in Rome for six years, subsequently receiving numerous commissions in Italy and in the papal seat at Avignon, though some of these works are now recognized to be by other artists. The central front panel represents St. Peter enthroned, flanked by saints, with Cardinal Stefaneschi on his right, offering up the altarpiece. Saints James and Paul are in the left panel, and John the Evangelist and Andrew are presented on the right. Now two of the three predella panels are lost, but it is believed they all represented half-length figures of saints. The back central panel represents Christ enthroned, flanked by angels with a kneeling Cardinal Stefaneschi at his right foot. The left panel represents the crucifixion of Peter, and the right side, the beheading of St. Paul. The predella depicts the Virgin and Child flanked by angels in the center and standing figures of the Twelve Apostles on the sides. The altarpiece originally stood before the apse of old St. Peter's, which in the 14th century contained a mosaic of Christ enthroned between Saints Peter and Paul. Therefore, the iconography of the front of the painting paralleled the apse mosaic in form, but did not repeat it in iconography. The central panel of the back of the altarpiece duplicated the apse mosaic for those that could not see it, as they would sit with their backs to it, while the side panels introduced narratives. It was customary for double-sided altarpieces to have an iconic image on the front and narrative images on the back. Giotto di Bondone represents the martyrdoms of Peter and Paul as taking place in recognizable locations, frequently visited by pilgrims to Rome. Peter's crucifixion is placed between the Meta Romuli, a pyramid near the Vatican, destroyed in the 15th century, and the obelisk that came from Nero's circus, while Paul's beheading is outside the city, near a round building that symbolizes the saint's prison. These scenes could also be found in the medieval frescoes on the walls of the nave of Old St. Peter's. Although images of donors in church decorations in Rome went back to the early Christian period, Giotto's altarpiece for St. Peter's is unusual in both the double representation of the donor, front and back, and the intense detail of the face and costume of Cardinal Stefaneschi. The patron is dressed in full ceremonial costume as a cardinal on the front, appropriate for the public face of the altarpiece, and is introduced to St. Peter by St. George. On the back, he is more modestly dressed as a canon, suitable for the audience on this side of the painting. In his biography on Giotto, Vasari cited portraiture as one of the artist's greatest strengths, which is confirmed by the detailed individualistic faces of the Stefaneschi triptych.
In 1328, Giotto was summoned by Robert of Anjou, the King of Naples, to his court. It is possible that he was recommended to Robert of Anjou by the Bardi family, for whom he had recently completed a series of frescoes for the family chapel in the church of Santa Croce. In Naples, meanwhile, Giotto became a court painter, which meant that he gave up the more precarious itinerant lifestyle that had so far characterized his career. He was given a salary and a stipend for materials and assistance, and in 1330 Robert of Anjou named him Familiaris, meaning that he had become part of the royal household. Regrettably, almost nothing of his work from this period survives. A fragment of a fresco portraying the lamentation of Christ in the church of Santa Chiara bears his mark, as does the group of illustrious men that adorn the windows of the Santa Barbara Chapel of Castelnuovo, though historians usually attribute these works to pupils of Giotto. Madonna and Child Washington version. This panel painting was most likely the central section of a five-part altarpiece executed for the Santa Croce, completed late in Giotto's career. The other panels of the altarpiece are scattered around in various museums across the world, while the Madonna and Child is held in Washington's National Gallery. In the composition, Giotto utilizes a conservative Byzantine-style background in gold leaf, symbolizing the realm of heaven, and the white rose is a traditional symbol of Mary's purity, as well as a reference to the innocence lost through original sin. Yet this Madonna and Child introduces a new naturalistic trend for painting at that time. The sober and restrained colors, blended with the soft shadows, create the weight and volume of the bodies and the pull of gravity on them, marking the work as a particular modern interpretation of a very common theme. The artist's focus is the human interaction between a mother and child, as the infant steadies himself by grasping Mary's finger, reaching for the flower she holds. The emphasis on the humanity of the figures is a departure from the devotional Byzantine tradition represented by the likes of Duccio and his followers. Bologna Polyptic. After working in Naples, Giotto stayed for a while in Bologna, where he painted a polyptic for the Church of Santa Maria degli Angeli. Believed to have been partly painted by the workshop, the altarpiece consists of five panels and a predella. In the central panel, the Madonna sits on a Gothic throne flanked by St. Peter, the Archangel Gabriel, the Archangel Michael and St. Paul. The four saints accompanying the Virgin appear austere and stern, whilst the Madonna herself has the appearance of an elegant and sophisticated woman. The polyptych is celebrated for its richness and gold decorations, presenting a dazzling array of colors that complement the overall impression of divine brilliance. Giotto's Campanile. Thirty years after the death of Arnolfo di Cambio, the first master of the works of Florence's cathedral, 
Giotto was nominated as his successor in 1334. At that time, the artist was 67 years old. Giotto concentrated his architectural work on the design and construction of a Campanile bell tower for the cathedral. He had become an eminent architect due to the growing autonomy of the architect designer in relation to the craftsman since the first half of the 13th century. The first stone was laid on 19th of July 1334 and the design was in harmony with the polychromy of the cathedral as applied by Arnolfo di Cambio, giving the tower a view as if it were painted. In his design Giotto also applied chiaroscuro and a form of perspective instead of a strict linear drawing of the campanile, as well as designing a surface of coloured marble in geometric patterns. When Giotto died in 1337, he had only finished the lower floor with its marble external revetment, decorated with geometric patterns of white marble from Carrara, green marble from Prato, and red marble from Siena. The lower floor is decorated on three sides with bass reliefs in hexagonal panels, seven on each side. When the entrance door was enlarged in 1348, two panels were moved to the empty northern side, and only much later, five more panels were commissioned from Luca della Robbia in 1437. It is difficult to attribute who created these panels, though some may be by Giotto himself, while the others are most likely by Andrea Pisano or a mixture from their workshops. Through his planning of the bell tower, Giotto is now considered, along with Brunelleschi and Alberti, as one of the founding fathers of Italian Renaissance architecture. He was succeeded as master of the works in 1343 by Andrea Pisano, famous already for the south doors of the baptistery. Pisano continued the construction of the bell tower, closely following Giotto's design. Pisano was replaced in his turn by Francesco Talenti, who built the top three levels with the large windows, completing the bell tower in 1359. He opted not to build the spire designed by Giotto, lowering the designed height of 122 metres to 84.7 metres. The top, with its breathtaking panorama of Florence and the surrounding hills, can be reached by climbing 414 steps. After his time in Naples, Giotto stayed briefly in Bologna, where he painted a polyptych for the Church of Santa Maria degli Angeli and, it is thought, a lost decoration for the chapel in the Cardinal Legate's castle. In 1334, Giotto returned once more to Florence. Here he was appointed Capo Maestro, or Master of Municipal Construction Works and Head of the Cathedral Masons Guild. He oversaw artworks for the construction of Florence's cathedral, while his own contribution was a design for a bell tower, though only the lower part was built to his stipulations. The new church, work on which commenced at the end of the 13th century, was modelled on the 7th century church of Santa Reparata and would not be completed for another 200 years. As a mark of the esteem in which he was held, Giotto was buried in the Santa Reparata at the expense of the city following his death on 8th of January 1337. Giotto's influence over the development of the Italian Renaissance and, consequently, over much of the history of European art is significant. Recognized in his own time as a master by poets and thinkers such as Dante and Boccaccio, Giotto's developments of pictorial space and a quest for an unprecedented degree of realism would inspire the early instigators of the Renaissance in Florence. In particular, his influence can be seen in the sculptural revolution instigated by figures such as Lorenzo Ghiberti and Donatello in the first decade of the 1400s, 
while his artistic inheritance can also be recognized in the paintings of the young Masaccio forward of 1420. Giotto's influence comes particularly from his incipient steps towards Renaissance humanism, a school of thought that would be essential to the development of Renaissance art. Humanism involved looking to the world of antiquity for learning and pictorial techniques. In Giotto's work, this can be seen in his interest in depicting human emotions and in his modeling of the human figure, and in his ability to break down the distance between biblical characters and human viewers. Humanism can also be found in Giotto's interest in architecture, proportion, perspective, and even engineering. These were also significant elements of later developments in Renaissance humanist thought and art, in which human beings became central to artistic endeavor and the realistic depiction of figures and emotion became paramount. It is notable that there was a significant gap between the early groundbreaking work of Giotto around 1300 and the major revolution in art that began around a century later. This is probably because the years in between Giotto's death and the beginning of the 15th century were marked by plague and economic downturn. The plague epidemic of 1348 took the lives of a huge proportion of the inhabitants of Florence, as well as of cities such as Siena, which before this point had a burgeoning artistic movement and style of its own, but from which it never recovered. It was not until the relative stability and prosperity of Florence at the beginning of the 1400s that Giotto's achievements could be fully admired and built upon. Giotto's influence continued to be recognized by later artists, and his work saw a resurgence of interest among modernists working in the first half of the 20th century, including figures such as Henry Moore and Roger Fry.